our final presentation uh, will be given by Professor uh, Mark Harrison uh, from Oxford. Um, and Professor, whenever you're ready, please share your PowerPoint. Yes, yes, he's professional. Thank you. Okay, um, well, thank you again for inviting me to give this talk. It's a great pleasure to do that. It's just a, a shame, obviously, I'm not there in person to do it. I'm looking forward to the time when I can do that again. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, pandemics and protests. And this, this is based on a sort of distillation of work that I've done before and also work of many other historians. Also reflecting to, to some extent uh, work I've been doing for UK government as, a, as an advisor on some of the security aspects of, of the, the pandemic as it affects the UK. And that's also augmented by uh, 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 an urgent research grant, which uh, um, I got with a, a number of other scholars from the Economic and Social Research Council to address some of these issues. And so I, I'm very thankful to them for that. Um, so I'd just like to begin with uh, a few kind of general statements about epidemics and pandemics um, in relation to disorder in protests, and then to, to move on to um, COVID-19. Uh, uh, the first thing is really a kind of historiographical observation. I think now we are all pretty accustomed to the idea that epidemics provide a kind of test to the societies that they affect. And this is an idea that emerged in the, the 1960s, um, particularly in the, in, the, in the UK initially, um, it's very closely associated with Asa Briggs, the historian, later Lord Briggs, who became, uh, I suppose, quite influential as a social historian, as opposed to a medical historian. And he was looking at uh, cholera in the early 19th century and saw that it was a, a significant challenge to British society coming as it did at the same time as a, a other important political and economic upheavals in British society, um, reform agitation, agricultural rebellion, and so on and so forth. And, and since then, you know, these basic, this basic observation has been made of many other societies around the world that very often when epidemics hit societies, they, they create a lot of tension. They bring latent tensions and grievances to the surface so that they become more visible. And this is one of the reasons uh, that historians have actually uh, been um, disposed to examine them. Um, one of the, well, I suppose one of the quite important gen generalizations is that in modern times, that's really over the last couple of hundred years, it's usually the case that if there is a significant amount of disorder or social protest arising from an epidemic, it's usually caused not so much by the disease itself, but actually by state intervention which is regarded as being kind of illegitimate in some way by at least some sections of the population. But in fact, it's really the kind of the interplay between the disease, the nature of the disease and how fearful people are of it and the way the government responds to it, which is really the, the key determinants of the, the extent to which uh, society is radically challenged by an epidemic. So this, this is just a, a very brief overview of the, what I think are the kind of key factors in, that determine the, uh, the extent to which an epidemic tests social cohesion. So uh, very obviously um, with the biological factors, I won't spend very long on this, obviously the, the extent to which a disease is fatal, its case fatality rate is obviously a big important of big importance in how pe fearful people are of the epidemic and the degree of panic in society. Also, how it's spread, um, the, the extent to which it's seen to be contagious or how it's contagious, for instance, whether it's sexually transmitted, transmitted through um, as a kind of respiratory virus. Um, biological demographics, these are also important because, say, if a, if a disease um, is affecting maybe younger members of the population 
more than older members of the population, like the, the, the so-called Spanish influenza in 1918-1919, then it can create much greater fear. Um, whereas in most cases, epidemics tend to affect people at you know, either end most in terms of fatality tend to affect people either of older age have compromised immune systems or very often younger people, very, very young people like infants. So the, the biological demographic breakdown of, of fatality is also important. Um, the, the kind of symptoms and the after effects of the disease are also significant uh, variables because if, a, if the symptoms of a disease are very unpleasant or possibly undignified like cholera or uh, leave permanent scarring like smallpox, for instance, or in some cases things like you know, blindness, deafness and so on, those, those are also obviously important factors in, um, in the extent to which a population is fearful and may be inclined to panic. And I think crucially, particularly in the case of uh, COVID-19, and also, ag again, in the case of cholera in the early 19th century, if a disease appears to be a new one in a population, if, it, if it, there's a gr great degree of uncertainty about it, then that is also apt to cause a great deal of confusion and fear, but above all, you know, propensity for lack of understanding and how to deal with it among officials. Um, and even though a disease may be not highly fatal, that sort of uncertainty can great, give rise to a good deal of social disruption and misunderstanding at all levels. And so in terms of the social factors, well, you know, diseases often tend to expose social inequalities. Sometimes certain sections of the population, usually the poor, um, are more vulnerable. And that's you know, particularly the, the case in most countries with COVID-19. Government responses, as I've already mentioned, are, 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 are often the key thing that affects the extent to which the epidemics affect their populations. And I'll say a lot more about that in, in a second. Um, pre-existing levels of trust in government and also the agencies of government, whether it's the police, the medical profession or, and so on, are, are crucially important. Where that doesn't exist prior to an epidemic, it's actually very hard to establish that kind of trust in the context of an emergency. And uh, civil society responses are, are also important. So if a society is quite cohesive, it often organises itself in terms of mutual aid and so on. But if it isn't cohesive, there can be a lot of blame and scapegoating. So that's, so that's some sort of background generalizations. Well, we're obviously at the moment, we're, we're not simply in an epidemic, but we're in a, a, a pandemic with lots of individual epidemics in different countries. So how does a pandemic affect the, the way in which um, disease impacts on a society? Well, I think the key thing, and, and this is certainly the case since the late 19th century, when people have been apt to see, well, when people really began to, to kind of think about the pandemic in, in a way that we understand it, partly because of press coverage, partly because of photography, like the photograph you can see here, which is for British soldiers destroying part of Hong Kong in 1894 during the plague in an attempt to try to prevent it. These, these sort of images circulating around the world built up a sense that, um, you know, uh, of the kind of the immediacy of what was happening in other parts of the world and make people made people think to a much greater degree about disease being a global problem as opposed to just a national and regional problem. When that started to happen, um, you know, it, it became clear that the public's perception in different countries of disease was affected by what was happening in other countries, what they could see and read about. Um, and so if, if there's a great deal of disruption in other parts of the world as a result of a pandemic, like say the third plague, plague pandemic in the 1890s, early 1900s, then that would create similar kinds of panic in other places. Among states, um, it also intensified the kind of competitive emulation that had already existed, particularly in the, in the West, you know, really since the Renaissance between different countries who wanted to kind of uh, establish their 
um, credentials as be as responsible governments, and often to try to show how how much better they were than other countries that controlling the disease. But also, um, it, it also led you know some states to explicitly reject the models that were being used by other countries, and you can see all those those patterns of thought and behavior playing themselves out in the, the COVID-19 pandemic as well. Now, a few sort of general points about disorder and protest. I mean, the first thing is that on the whole, uh, historians have tended to exaggerate the extent to which epidemics um, actually give rise to serious social disorder or protest. Uh, and that's a point which is made uh, quite effectively by Samuel Cohn in this book you can see here uh, on epidemics, where he's saying, on the whole, epidemics tend to produce, in some cases, even more social cohesion. And you see a lot of evidence of compassion, as opposed to scapegoating, uh, blame, he heavy-handed government intervention and rioting and so on, the kind of things that most historians have actually focused on. But yet, of course, as we know, in some epidemics, that does those things do occur. Now, disorder isn't the same thing as protest, but disorder can often be, particularly in modern societies, a manifestation of protest. Protest can take all many forms, sometimes kind of constitutional forms, sometimes simply articles in, in the media, um, but it can also be expressed in terms of civic disorder. And that's kind of what I'm focusing on in this, in this talk. And it can really be of two types, non-state related, which is maybe where sections of society are attacking each other. So scapegoating, blame, very often based on ethnic differences or religious differences. Uh, but disorder usually is state related, particularly in the modern period. And it typically includes these various forms, it, rioting and affray, violence against state agents like police and doctors, um, various types of um, in mass industrial action or strikes. Now, as far as protests against the state are, are concerned, the most common causes are perceived discrimination. This is where the uh, sections of the population, it could be um, social classes or maybe um, uh, ethnic groups or in some cases people of uh, different sexuality perceive that the measures which are being taken discriminate against them. Another common cause is perceived disproportionality that's where or inconsistency that's where the population believes the measures exceed that which are really ne those which are really necessary to control the epidemic. So, in other words, they may suspect that there is another measure, another another motive behind the measures which are being taken. And obviously, in in the in the case of societies where there's um, limited amount of trust in government, mm. then that suspicion is more likely to occur inconsistency of interventions. In other words, if the government keeps changing the way in which it deals with it over time, or if it deals with the epidemic in different way, maybe in different parts of a country or something like that, that sort of inconsistency usually gives rise to a lack of confidence. And in the case of a long epidemic or pandemic like, like COVID, there's obviously more chance for those kind of inconsistencies to, to emerge. So it's kind of a cumulative problem. Um, third, inequality of impact is, is really very important. So even if a measure doesn't discriminate against different parts of the population, if it's applied equally and fairly across the population, it could still be, for instance, in the case of lockdowns and quarantines, that certain parts of the population are much, much, hard, much more um, harder hit than other parts of the population. In the case of those measures like quarantine or lockdowns, then it's usually the, the lower income groups or the people who have very insecure unemployment, insecure employment who are affected by those measures. And that's a, that's a global phenomenon, something the, the WHO has, has spoken about repeatedly over the last month or so. Um, 
uh, fourthly, heavy-handed interventions by state actors like police and doctors, particularly where they don't respect cultural norms, religious beliefs, those things can and often do, or have done throughout history, kind of created a, a lot of tension and sometimes violent backlash. So moving on to the present. Um, so looking, what I want to do here is having sort of just given you a summary of some of the main themes in the historiography, what generalizations can we actually make about the current pandemic? It's one of the things I'll be looking at. Also, what are the similarities and differences with previous pandemics or epidemics? And what we can learn from the experiences so far and also from history too, um, that might help us with the, the later phases of this pandemic or, or, or ones to come. So first of all, I want to look at <clears throat> one aspect of this, this uh, pandemic, which you can see some historical precedent for, is a fear about, uh, of people actually spreading the disease into communities. So this is not necessarily uh, a form of state related process, but sometimes it can be related to the state. So in a number of countries, and this would include India, for instance, there have been quite a few attacks on people who have been suspected of inf being infected um, for no good reason, who just come into a community, very often in rural areas, but not, not exclusively in rural areas, who, who are believed to be infected. Um, and this is obviously a kind of fear factor. Um, but this kind of um, the scapegoating, particularly of certain in certain types of individuals who go into a community can also be a form of social protest, particularly if the, the movement of those individuals is associated in some way with um, a social situation or political situation which is, which is seen to be um, oppressive. And in the case of India, sometimes um, people who maybe represent uh, economic interests or government interests who come into some rural communities have been, have been attacked and killed. And you can see similar things happening all over the world in parts of Latin America, for instance, and in, and in Africa. So this isn't just a sort of form of <clears throat> sort of community violence against outsiders. It can also be a form of social protest. In some cases, protest has also actually of this kind has also been backed by rival states, allegedly. This is, this is certainly what has been alleged to have happened in the Ukraine, where you know, some infected in individuals um, were placed in quarantine and there was a great you know, was considerable anxiety and violent protest in some of those localities and the Ukrainian government was alleging that this had all been stoked by the Russians. So it can actually play out in two in terms of international politics. Now I think most obviously COVID-19 has highlighted social inequalities um, in two ways. Uh, firstly in terms of exposure to the disease and secondly in terms of those who have actually suffered most from the disease when they've had it. Um, and this is the case in particular with, with poor people um, who have suffered from the disease and the measures which have taken to control it disproportionately. The poor are more at risk very often because they live in overcrowded dwellings. They are more at risk because the jobs they do um, tend to expose them to a greater load of the virus than, than most middle-class people who work in offices and so on. And the poor also much more at risk from the measures, as I've already pointed out. If you have a lockdown measure, very often people are unable to move to, to go to work and lose the job. In the case of some countries where you don't have people on, on regular contracts, that's particularly the case, they just have no means of income. And so, unless the government it adequately supports them, which it does in some countries, but doesn't at all in others, then there's incredible amounts of hardship. And this can give rise to social protest, um, like the, in the picture here, which you can see this is um, 
uh, you know, social protest in, in, in India against uh, economic, where economic migrants were protesting against the, the government lockdown measures. Young people have also suffered disproportionately from the measures which have been taken, although not from the disease itself. Um, in many countries, young people, obviously, for, you know, who want to socialize with each other have had their lives blighted by the lockdown measures, but also their education and employment chances in many countries. And so is a quite what's emerging, particularly in Western countries, I'm not sure if it's the same in, in Asian countries, is that there is a marked sense of intergenerational inequity that is related to COVID. And I think which is already showing itself in social protests. And I think it's going to show itself a lot more over the coming months as unemployment rises in some countries. And of course, there have also been many ethnic, um, there's also been a sense of ethnic inequality in a number of countries where certain groups see that they have higher death rates or maybe higher rates of um, uh, infection from the disease. And also some cases feel disproportionately affected by measures or indeed discriminated against. Now, a uh, word about the dynamics of protests. And I think this is something you see not just in the case of COVID, but also other periods of unrest before in which epidemics have occurred, um, is that very often um, disorder and social protest relating to an epidemic is, needs to be understood in a bigger context, in the, in the, in the context of what has happened before, immediately before. Now, in the case of COVID-19, at least in the West, we see, well, all over the world to some extent, we've seen have tensions which have been created by globalization. In the West, we've also seen um, a, a lot of tension created by the uh, racial inequality and the emergence of Black Lives Matter and, and some other uh, related organizations, and also a backlash by, by right-wing groups. In, in history, we can see similar cases where um, the discontent relating to an epidemic or measures taken to control it has become intertwined with other forms of political grievances. So in the early 19th century, across Europe in the cholera epidemics, you could see a, inter a relationship between distrust of the medical profession, distrust of social, higher social classes, and in many cases, distrust of government, particularly true in Russia and France. In the case of the late 19th century, um, with the third plague pandemic, there was, a great, there was a considerable backlash against some of the measures which were taken in different parts of the world, which is most, most uh, commonly seen in colonial contexts, where there's obviously a great deal of tension generated by colonialism. So what we're seeing when we see a social protest, which appears to be related to COVID-19, is not necessarily just related to COVID-19, it's probably intersected with it in all kinds of complex ways that we don't yet quite understand. So one of the, the key things to ameliorate that, to mitigate against that kind of um, disorder, is to actually have sensitive policing. And this is one of the things that I've been working on, where that doesn't exist and where there's a a perception that the police are being discriminatory in some way or too heavy handed, it can actually serve to release these tensions and create, you know, to transform tension into serious social discontent like rioting. As you can see here in, in London, this is during the Black Lives Matter movement. But there have also been some other in, interesting forms of protest, apart from rioting and affray. Um, during COVID-19, we've seen quite a few attacks against state agents all over the world, police and health workers. Um, it may seem perverse that health workers are being attacked, but in many cases they are actually seen as being responsible for spreading the disease. That's particularly been the case in some Latin American countries, for instance. Uh, we've seen in many countries, to varying degrees, um, ways of protesting by uh, refusing to social distance, refusing to wear masks, um, refusing to comply with contract tracing. There's to greater, you know, lesser or greater to extent, these practices are quite widespread and probably growing in many countries because of the duration of this pandemic. And this goes back to 
something that uh, Professor Kojima was saying earlier. But also, this is, may seem slightly bizarre to people in, in East Asia, but in, in many other parts of the world, in the West, there have also been destruction of symbolic targets, which have included health facilities and also 5G phone masts. That's been a kind of big phenomenon in many European countries, in the US, also in New Zealand. And the 5G phone masks have been identified by some people as uh, what they've been alleged to uh, undermine people's health, making them more susceptible to COVID. But also there have been some groups, particularly eco-extremist and anarchist groups, who have attacked mobile phone masks in order to prevent a return to normality after the pandemic. So there's a very complex reasons behind this kind of attack. And this you can hear, you can see a mobile phone mast uh, ablaze earlier this year in the UK. Um, unlicensed music events have been another form of protest in many countries, including the UK, and which have given rise to you know a few situations which have been close to to riots. And there's been you know extensive throughout the world evidence of ethnic and class conflict. So my point is really about COVID nineteen is. Well, it's a question, really. Um, this is obviously very different from a lot of pandemics in the sense that um, in the case of a usual, in the, in the usual case with an epidemic or pandemic, you see most of the most intense forms of protest and social disorder coming near the beginning when states begin to impose quite harsh measures to deal with the disease. In the case of COVID-19, it's been far more uneven than that. I mean, the forms of protests that have occurred have been sporadic and they varied in, in intensity across countries. But I think in many countries, the most turbulent times lay ahead. And that's largely as a result of the, of the long duration of this pandemic and growing frustration and fatigue, fatigue of the measures, but also probably more importantly, the economic impact of the pandemic and rising unemployment or underemployment or anxiety about employment. I think all those things combined with a sense of intergenerational inequity are going to lead to a lot of problems. Hence my sort of question, is this going to be a pandemic with a sting in its tail? And I suspect that it might be. So here are my conclusions. Why has this disease generated a fair amount of protest globally, and is there potential for more? Um, firstly, I think, although it's not a particularly fatal disease compared with others that we've witnessed, um, it is a new disease and uncertainty, uh, because of that, uncertainty is much greater. And most many governments have lacked the capacity to respond effectively on a measured way to that. Um, it's all, it's uncertainty has also made it difficult for the public to understand what a legitimate reaction by government should look like. So, um, you know, they might think that a government, what a government doing is doing is maybe too much or maybe too little, simply because there is no precedent on how to deal with this particular kind of disease. And that type of uh, uncertainty is certainly exists in many Western countries, maybe not so much in East Asia, but it certainly exists here. And uh, COVID has also released a lot of latent tensions resulting from globalization, intergenerational tensions that already existed before uh, this pandemic. Um, and it's also become intertwined with things that were already emerging before the pandemic, like a you know, sense of uh, inequity on sometimes on racial lines. Um, or on class lines in various countries. So I think the one, one thing about these processes so far is that they've been pretty ephemeral. Um, they've lacked effective or at least consistent leadership. They've sometimes been effective tactically, but they are mostly sort of short-term expressions of anger and frustration. What I think might happen is because of the long duration of this pandemic and the, the secondary effects of it, particularly unemployment, um, and all this kind of tensions that's going to create, not just 
anxiety, not just anger with the government, but blaming of different social classes or different ethnic groups, that this has the danger to kind of turn into chronic unrest, perhaps with, uh, perhaps under uh, uh, leaders who have a much more strategic sense of how to use that for their own ends. So that's uh, where I'll finish. Thank you very much for your time.